Welcome to week 12 in our 15 week semester. This week we cover chapter 12, uh, or we begin chapter 12, and um, chapter 12 is entitled Alcohols, Thiols, Ethers, Aldehydes, and Ketones. So in this chapter we're going to be covering a number of those functional groups that we talked about um, last week. I've split this lecture into two parts. So this is part one of chapter 12. Again, we begin with alcohols, the first functional group in this chapter. An alcohol, let's just refresh our memory, is a compound with an OH group that's bonded then to a non-aromatic, or an alkyl, as we call it, carbon. Um, so we oftentimes in organic chemistry, we generalize the alkyl carbon, because remember an alkyl carbon can be one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, uh, any number of carbons attached to that hydroxyl group. And we don't want to be drawing them all the time, so we call them an R group, okay? So you'll see that throughout this lecture. So that just means some sort of a carbon chain. Um, all right, so we have this OH group, as we call it. The OH group has a name associated with it. It is referred to as a hydroxyl group. So an alcohol, a compound with a hydroxyl group bonded to a non-aromatic carbon. Let's look at some of our common alcohols. Here's a one carbon alcohol. This is the very simplest alcohol that we can possibly have. This um, you might know or you might have heard of it as methyl alcohol. Methyl alcohol is its common name. Um, methanol is its IUPAC name and we'll shortly learn how to name alcohols using that method. Um, another common name for this alcohol is wood alcohol. So we're going to see something uh, with the naming of, of alcohols as well as a number of the different functional groups this week. We're going to see the advent or the introduction of common names. And these common names um, are the reason why the IUPAC system of nomenclature came about because these names don't often make sense, these common names, but they're entrenched. So we're going to throw a couple of them at you this week. All right, so here is a two carbon alcohol. So this is another very common alcohol. This is ethyl alcohol. And again, this is the common name for this two carbon alcohol. The IUPAC name is ethanol. And another common name that you may have heard it referred to by is grain alcohol. Let's continue on and let's look at some other common alcohols. So here is one. So this is a branched alcohol and this is known as isopropyl alcohol. That's another common name. So this is the uh, this, of course, is the condensed structure for isopropyl alcohol. So let's expand it out. Remember, we said you should be able to do that. Okay, so the condensed structure for isopropyl alcohol, the expanded structure for isopropyl alcohol. So um, some other names that it goes by. So isopropyl alcohol is a common name. Isopropanol is an IUPAC name along with two propanol. And another common name is, this is what's called rubbing alcohol. All right, another alcohol here. This is a very common one. This is a dye alcohol, which we call a diol. All right, let's expand it out and see what it looks like. It's two carbons, right? Um, and each of them has a hydroxyl group attached. Okay, so 
This is ethylene glycol, better known as the antifreeze, and it's IUPAC name 1,2-ethane diol. And our last common alcohol here, we see that we have 1, 2, 3 hydroxyl groups attached to this particular uh, alcohol. So this is a triol. Let's expand it out just a bit. It's not the total expanded structure, but um, expand it just a tad. And here we see it. There's our one, two, three hydroxyl groups, and they're attached to each of the three carbons in this particular compound. Again, this is a common alcohol. This is known as glycerol um, or glycerin which is a lubricant, okay, and it's a UPAC name, 1-2-3-propane-triol. All right, so we've had an introduction to some of the more common alcohols that you're going to stumble across, um, but we need to name them uh, by the IUPAC names because those are the ones, those are the names that we most commonly use, all right? Um, when the IUPAC rules are used to name an alcohol, the parent, remember we talked about that three-part name, that continues on through all of the functional groups. We're always going to go back to our rules for alkanes because they form the basis. The parent, which was the longest continuous carbon chain, all right? And now in this case, it's going to be the longest continuous carbon chain carrying that hydroxyl group. All right, we're going to find that. And then we're going to number it from the end that's closest to the hydroxyl group. And you're then going to name that parent chain by dropping the E ending of the alkane and adding instead an O L. All right. Notice alcohol O L. Okay. So the O L ending on a name is going to indicate you have an alcohol. All right. So when a parent chain contains more than two carbon atoms, you have to specify the position of that hydroxyl group with a number. And then if you have branches on there, any alkyl groups that are attached to the parent chain are going to be identified by their name, by their position, and how many times we see them. Okay, so everything gets numbered. Everything has to be unambiguous in terms of its uh, identity and its position. So if you have two methyl groups, all right, each of them gets a number, all right? All right, um, and one of the things that you're noticing in these rules is that that hydroxyl group is receiving precedence. We're numbering the chain. Um, so that we're going to give that hydroxyl group the lowest possible number. And um, you might want to consider the hydroxyl group as one of uh, those pushy friends, okay? Everybody uh, has a circle of friends. And if back in the day when we used to be able to go out and you decide, okay, it's Friday night, we want to go out, all right? Where are we going to go? And everybody's hemming and hawing. And one person is the one that directs the whole show and everybody else follows along. That's that hydroxyl group. Okay, so let's look at some examples using those rules. Okay, here we go. Um, so we see here we have two carbons, one and two, All right? Notice how I am numbering this. I am numbering it uh, closest to the alcohol. I'm always going to start where that hydroxyl group is, right? So this particular one, we really don't have to um, number it because it doesn't matter whether that hydroxyl group was here or here. It's going to have the same number, right? So this is just 
ethanol, no number needed, okay? Ethane was the alkane. We took the E off and we ended up with ethanol when we added the OH. All right, the common name, ethyl alcohol. So we're going to still give you the common names, um, but the first name that we'll, we'll give you is the IUPAC name. Okay, well, let's add another carbon on here. One, two, three now. Now there's multiple places where it can be. Okay, that hydroxyl group, it could be on the one, it could be on the two. So we need to say, where is it? Okay, so three carbons, propane, okay. We're going to take the E off and add OL. We get one propanol because that is the one carbon, right? We're going to number closest to it, two and three. Okay. All right. And this, it's common name, propyl alcohol. All right. So the common names you might notice, you're naming the carbon chain as an alkyl group and then just adding the word alcohol to it. Right, that's how those are derived. All right. So again, three carbons. All right. Doesn't matter which way I number. All right. Uh, there's still three. One, two, and three. So the parent alkane would have been propane. All right, we're going to take off the E ending. We're going to add OL. So this is a propanol also, but it's totally different from the one we just looked at. It is 2-propanol. Our hydroxyl group is on the second carbon, and our name indicates that, 2-propanol. We're following the same convention that we learned for the alkanes. All right, so what do we call this one? Its common name is isopropyl alcohol. Again, uh, why? Because that group of three carbons like that with attachment on the second one is known as an isopropyl group. Um, and we add the word alcohol. All right, let's see what else. Okay, time for you to try it. Okay, time for you to walk through. So let's name this molecule. All right, so there we go. All right, so I'm throwing you a zinger because it has a um, it has an alkyl group. It has a branch to it. All right, so find the longest continuous carbon chain that contains the hydroxyl group. And what do we find? We find it is three. Okay, so uh, one, two, and three. All right, and it doesn't matter which side I come from, right? So here's our two, and here's our three. I'm getting better at these, uh, writing with a mouse. All right, so one, two, and three. All right, so it would have been a what? A propane. We're going to remove the E ending and add OL because we have that alcohol group, okay? But we also have a methyl group. So remember location of substituents, right? That comes out front, that's that prefix, okay? So where is it? It's on the two. So it's going to be two dash methyl dash two dash propanol. So notice if we were asked, if we were given this name and we were asked to draw the structure, we're gonna pull it apart. Propanol means three carbons, right, with an alcohol, with an OH, hydroxyl group. Where's that hydroxyl? It's on the second. And what else is on the second carbon? A methyl group. Okay. Very good. All righty. Move on to our next topic regarding alcohols, the classification of alcohols. It turns out that alcohols are classified in one of three ways, depending upon their structure. They're classified as being primary, secondary, or tertiary. Well, what are these classifications? Well, these classifications are determined by the number of alkyl groups that are attached to the carbon 
that's bonded to your hydroxyl. That carbon bonded to the hydroxyl has a name. We refer to it as the hydroxyl carbon. All right, so let's let's look at examples. Then it becomes clearer exactly what we're talking about here. All right, let's look at an alcohol here. All right, so this is a two-carbon alcohol. All right, this is in fact ethanol. Right, and we're going to expand the uh, the groups around the carbon that is attached to the hydroxyl group. So this is the hydroxyl carbon right there. And notice we have two hydrogens and one alkyl group. Okay, one alkyl group attached to that hydroxyl carbon. When you have one alkyl group attached to the hydroxyl carbon, this is known as a primary alcohol. All right, and oftentimes you'll see in chemistry when we're talking primary, we abbreviate it with a one and a degree mark that indicates primary. All right, let's look at another alcohol. All right, so this is a branched alcohol. All right, well, not really. It's actually, uh, it's actually our propanol, two propanol, right? Two, three, two propanol. So not branched. The longest continuous carbon chain is going around a corner. All right. It looks branched, but it's not. All right. So here's our hydroxyl carbon. We're searching for that, the carbon to which the hydroxyl group is attached. And we're counting how many groups are attached, how many alkyl groups. One, and two alkyl groups attached. So when you've got two alkyl groups attached to the hydroxyl carbon, you guessed it, this is a secondary alcohol. It's secondary abbreviated with a two and the degree mark. All right. Let's look at the third type of alcohol that we can have. All right, so this is a branched alcohol. All right, longest continuous carbon chain. Here it is, one, two, three. And then we have a methyl, right? So this is 2-methyl, two 2-propanol two that we saw earlier, right? Let's find that hydroxyl carbon. Here it is. Here's the carbon to which our hydroxyl group is attached. Let's count up how many alkyl groups we have. Well, here's one. Okay, I'm getting pretty good at circles sometimes. All right, and three, one, two, and three. So we've got three groups attached here to the hydroxyl carbon. And this is what we call a tertiary alcohol. So primary alcohols, one alkyl group attached to the hydroxyl carbon. Secondary alcohol, two alkyl groups all right remember alkyl groups can be anything all right not just methyl groups they can be any alkyl group any carbon chain um, so that's secondary and when you have three alkyl groups attached to that hydroxyl carbon we call it a tertiary alcohol all right so remember those. It's going to be incredibly important later on when we're talking about reactions of uh, alcohols. All right, let's move on to properties. Properties of alcohols. So we've already looked at the hydrocarbons, right? The alkanes, the alkenes, the alkynes, all right? And we mentioned the, uh, the aromatics, the benzene rings also. Compared to the hydrocarbons with similar molecular weights, and you're always comparing to things with similar molecular weights, alcohols have relatively high boiling points in comparison why well the presence of that hydroxyl group all right their relatively high boiling points is because their ability to form hydrogen bonds remember hydrogen bonds are an intermolecular type attraction right and in order to go from one state to the other you have to break 
these bonds, all right? They're not as strong as the covalent bonds, right? That are holding the carbons, the hydrogens, the oxygen, the hydrogen together. But the hydrogen bonds is the strongest of the intermolecular attraction. So it takes a lot more energy and hence higher boiling points. Um, for example, all right, let's look at these hydrogen bonds that are now possible because you have this hydroxyl group. Let's take the simplest alcohol, all right, best one. Let's look at methanol, CH3OH, right? And let's show, remember what happens when you have an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. It's a polar bond, right? The oxygen is a uh, partially negatively charged, that hydrogen has got a partial positive charge. So that if you're looking at a solution uh, or a, a sample of methanol, okay, we're going to find that the methanol molecules are going to orient themselves so that the hydrogen of one, which has a partial positive charge, is going to be attracted to the oxygen in another molecule of the methanol forming a hydrogen bond and this goes on creating a network right so in order again to boil right to go from the liquid state to the gaseous state for methanol we have to break every single one of these hydrogen bonds that we have here all right and we're only showing one two three four five, six different molecules, all right, uh, when you're talking about a sample, you've got many, many more than that, and you have to put in enough energy to break all these bonds to take it from the liquid state to the gaseous state, hence the higher boiling points for the alcohols. We don't see this in the alkanes, the alkenes, or the alkynes. Let's continue with our properties of alcohols. Remember the rule back in our solubility chapter or, or solutions chapter, like dissolves like was our rule, right? If your solvent, right, and your solute have similar intermolecular forces, they are going to be soluble in one another. Okay. If they're not like, all right, then they're not going to be soluble. It's as simple as that. Well, we've got that hydroxyl group, which is polar. Alcohols with that small hydro hydroxyl part, and if the hydrocarbon part is small, they're going to be water soluble. For instance, methanol. Let's space fill the methanol. All right. Let's show a model. Let's expand it out. Okay. With the carbon, the three hydrogens, the oxygen, the hydrogen. Okay. So the methanol has a small organic part, the organic part or the hydrocarbon part, okay, right here, okay. And it also has this hydroxyl group, right, which is water-like, right? That small organic part, right, is not big enough to stop the methanol from hydrogen bonding with water. So methanol is in fact water soluble. But if we uh, add on more and more carbons, which are organic like, right? Okay, hydrocarbon like alcohols with large hydrocarbon parts, um, the hydrocarbon part overtakes that hydroxyl group and they are not soluble they are insoluble in water as an example let's use this one two three four five six seven one heptanol 
as an example. Notice how small that hydroxyl group is in comparison to the hydrocarbon part. Let's expand it out okay, with a model. All right, and we see that the part of the molecule, uh, it's got the very large organic hydrocarbon part, right, which is not like water. And so it is alkane-like, and alkanes, remember, um, they're not too soluble in water, all right? So um, the larger that hydrocarbon part of your alcohol, the uh, less soluble it is in water. So we find that small alcohols are soluble probably up to about five carbons, and after that, they tend to be uh, water insoluble. All right, so what's happening here? All right, why are we seeing this disparity in solubilities? Um, the bigger that hydrocarbon part, remember, it's London dispersion forces that we have going on, all right? Um, they increase the boiling point of uh, alcohols as that nonpolar portion of the molecule grows larger. So let's look at um, some different alcohols and let's look at their boiling point, right? Because these intermolecular forces are, are affecting the boiling point and they're affecting the water solubility. We're also adding in our, our IUPAC name and our common name, everything that we've looked at so far, okay? So we start with our uh, methanol, right? Our methanol with just one carbon, very small hydrocarbon part. And so we find that in terms of water solubility, it is miscible, right? Meaning uh, um, soluble in all parts. All right, so we're getting a little bit larger here. Let's also see what happens to the boiling point. The, the larger that, um, that uh, hydrocarbon chain, right? We're getting more London dispersion forces too. Okay, so remember we've got hydrogen bonding going on in all of them, all right, but um, we're also increasing that carbon chain. So as that happens, our boiling point is going up, all right, because the London dispersion forces are getting greater, all right, but at the same time, what's happening as that hydrocarbon part gets longer that's not soluble, right? Okay, our water solubility is decreasing. Okay, so that's the effect um, that we, we see on solubility and boiling points in these alcohols. All right, so let's let's see how good you uh, you did in internalizing that discussion. Let's think about the answers to a couple questions here. All right, I want you to look at some compounds in this in this particular question, and you're going to answer which of the following molecules can form hydrogen bonds to another molecule of the same type. All right, so which of these functional groups would experience hydrogen bonding and therefore have higher boiling points than an alkane would a hydrocarbon? Okay. So take a good look at them, all right, and write down your answers. I need to have the Jeopardy music. Do, 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 And that's why I'm a chemist, and I don't sing. All right. So I assume you have your answers. Okay, so remember what we're looking for for hydrogen bonds. If you don't remember, go back and review hydrogen bonds from our earlier chapter. Okay, answer. If you put A, C, and D, you are 100% correct.
correct. Of course, water forms hydrogen bonds. We just talked about the alcohol, that hydroxyl group can form hydrogen bonds. And here we see a carboxylic acid with a hydroxyl group. So yes, this one can too. Not for B. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. How about this one? Which molecule has the higher boiling point? Think about which one's going to have the stronger intermolecular forces. You got it? All right. If so, let's let's take a couple moments here while we're at it. Let's do some review. Let's name them. Right. These are cyclic compounds. Right. Um, so we have an alcohol and it's attached to a six membered ring. Remember, these are cycloalkanes. So this is cyclohexanol. All right. Uh, no number needed because there's nothing else on there. OK. And this one here is a, an alkane. Right. So this is methyl cyclohexanol. All right. So figure out which one is going to have the stronger intermolecular attractions. And that's your answer. So if you said cyclohexanol, you are 100 percent correct. OK, hydrogen bonding here. That's the stronger intermolecular attraction. Going to take more energy to break those hydrogen bonds. Higher boiling point here. All we have is those London dispersion forces. That's it. And so not as much energy required, lower boiling point. OK, very good. There's plenty more of those in the chapter to practice. Okay. We move on to our our next functional group, ethers. OK, ethers. Recall that an ether is a compound that has an oxygen sandwiched to two organic groups, to two carbons. OK, so the oxygen is bonded to two. It's sandwiched in the center. Remember what we said about these R groups. There are designation for carbons, right? An alkyl chain of some sort. OK, let's give you one example here and then we'll continue on with nomenclature. OK, so here we go. We see an oxygen sandwiched between carbon on this side, carbon on that side. OK, and when we see that, that is an ether, right? Here's another ether, OK? That oxygen could be sandwiched between two carbons in a ring, OK? It still is. There it is. There's one carbon. There's the other carbon. It just so happens that those are bonded together, OK? So cyclic ether. All right, how do we name ethers? Well, what we're going to use here, all right, to name ethers, it's a relatively easy way to name, all right, and these are simple ethers that you're going to learn, all right, so this is for uh, the naming system for simple ethers. Ethers are named simply by identifying those two organic groups of things that we call R groups, okay, and adding the word ether at the end. Very simple. So let's take the simplest ether that we could possibly have, an oxygen sandwiched between two methyl groups. OK. So we're going to use some of the same convention that we used with the alkanes and the alcohols. Remember, if you have two of a group, we use di, right? Dimethyl ether. The fact that it's an ether tells us one methyl's on one side, the other methyl's on the other, because that's the nature of the ether functional group, the oxygen sandwiched between two groups. All right. So those two groups can be the same, in which case we're going to use that di uh, um, convention. All right. Or our groups can be different, such as here. All right. We have a methyl group and one, two. That's an ethyl group. Um, we're going to use convention that we used with our alkanes. Remember, if we had two different groups, we alphabetized. Okay, 
So here we go. Ethyl comes first, right? Ethyl, methyl, ether. Okay, simply name them. That's it. Let's do another one. Okay. All right, so we look at them. Two groups, we name them. Two carbons, so that's an ethyl group two carbons that's an ethyl so they're both the same we're going to use that di convention so this is di ethyl ether all right so when when we showed you some examples we showed you that that oxygen of an ether could also be in a ring okay so in other words it could be a cyclic ether cyclic ethers uh, they're given common names. So I'm going to give you three uh, common ethers. All right. This is ethylene oxide. Um, this oxygen in a five membered ring is tetrahydrofuran. And this is a, a solvent. And here's another common solvent. This one's got uh, two sandwiched oxygen so this is one for dioxane all right so they're simply given common names all right all right let's move to our properties of ethers well we notice from the functional group right an oxygen sandwiched between two carbons that there's no hydrogen bonding. Ethers do not hydrogen bond to one another. And as a result of no hydrogen bonding, our intermolecular forces are going to be hydrogen bonds. All right. So where are their boiling points going to end up? They're going to have lower boiling points than alcohols. What about solubility? The Ether oxygen can form hydrogen bonds with water. This is going to cause low molecular weight ethers to be water soluble, right? Because the oxygen is going to have a partial negative charge because it's more electronegative. So that ether oxygen can form hydrogen bonds with water. So your low molecular weight ethers, those with small alkyl groups, will be water soluble. But the minute you start getting large alkyl groups, long carbon chains, right, that uh, hydrocarbon part is going to be much bigger and they're going to become water insoluble. What else do we find out about ethers? Well, simple ethers are highly flammable solvents. Diethyl ether, extremely so, uh, flammable. And that's about all for our ethers. Very short and sweet. All right. Um, do not forget them. We're going to see them again when we talk about carbohydrates because uh, the way monosaccharides are uh, bonded together is through an ether linkage and that's how we get disaccharides polysaccharides etc okay we move on to sulfides sulfides have the general formula rsr what does that mean that means we have a sulfur right that's sandwiched between two carbon groups two alkyl groups so they are as we say the sulfur analog of ethers look at the similarity right okay the only difference is ethers got an oxygen sulfides have a sulfur they are sulfur analogs of ether how do we name them well we're going to use common names okay um for naming them because that's that's the easier way to do it all right um, and what do you do? You place the word sulfide after the alkyl groups, just as we did with the ethers, right? Same way we named the ethers. So if this were an ether, this would be dimethyl uh, ether, 
So this is a sulfide. It's the sulfur analog. So this is dimethyl sulfide. We put the sulfide at the end, just like we did ether. Okay, so here we have two different groups. Okay, we have the methyl, we have the ethyl. Again, following convention, the ethyl comes first. It's ethyl methyl sulfide. And let's, I think this is my last one, last example here. Here we have an ethyl group, an ethyl group, right? So it's diethyl sulfide. All right. We move on to thiols. Thiols have the uh, general formula R. And again, what's an R? That means a carbon chain, an alkyl group of some length, all right, bonded to a sulfur, which is bonded to a hydrogen. Hmm, they're sulfur analogs of our alcohols. See the similarity? All right, the only difference is rather than an oxygen, we have a sulfur, a thiol. Okay, that's what that name implies a sulfur alcohol, so to speak. The systematic name, all right. Systematic means IUPAC. We're going to use IUPAC names of a thiol is formed simply by adding thiol to the parent hydrocarbon name. So we're going to name it as a hydrocarbon. This would be ethane, right? Ethane, and then we're going to name add the word thiol to it. So that's ethane thiol. All right, let's let's go big here. All right, so we're going to name our alkane. All right, one, two, three, four. All right, so it's three methyl, okay, butane. Three dash methyl dash, and then where is that thiol? Just like in alcohol, we have to say where it is. One dash butane thiol, and we run it all together. So again, we're using the same convention that we learned for the alkanes. Thiols, it turns out, um, of all the functional groups, have a, quite a characteristic foul smell about them. Um, some of our more common foul smells um, are attributed to the fact that they're thiols. For instance, onions, all right? Onions are thiol, right? Which thiol? One propane thiol gives that foul smell to the onions. Garlic, all right? That smell is due to two propane one thiol. And Probably one of the most hideous uh, smells, skunk spray, all right, is attributed to a thiol. Which thiol? It's trans to butene one thiol. So you should be able to take these names. This one here, I didn't do the structure for, but you should be able to take that um, name and convert it into a structure. All right, this one is, is cool because it's using a lot of the terminology that you uh, should know. Okay, the ene, right? Butene, four carbons. Where's the double bond? Second carbon, right? Uh, trans relationship between the two groups. And on the first carbon, we have that thiol, we have that sulfur to hydrogen bond. Okay. Alrighty, so we move on to disulfides. It turns out that thiols, right, the sulfur analogs of alcohols, react with mild oxidizing agents. And when they do, they yield disulfides. Disulfides have the following functional group. Right, disulfides sulfur to sulfur bond, and each sulfur then is uh, bonded to a carbon chain of some length. So, here's what we're talking about here. All right, here we see a dithiol. Okay.
by a compound, long chain, right? And we've got two thiols on it. So just like an alcohol or, or a compound with two alcohol, two hydroxyl groups was a diol. This is a dithiol, all right? Treat it with an oxidizing agent, all right? So oxygen. And what happens is these two bond together and we end up, notice, with a disulfide, all right? So sulfur-sulfur bond, and each of those is attached to a carbon chain, okay? It just so happens it's the same carbon chain, okay? These sulfur-sulfur bonds um, are present between two cysteines. Cysteine is an amino acid, and sulfur sulfur bonds between two cysteine molecules contribute to giving protein molecules their shapes in order to function. Hair proteins. Hair protein uh, is rich in um, thiol groups and also disulfides. When you perm hair, okay, maybe you have straight hair, straighter hair has more um, thiol groups in them, okay? So uh, maybe not as many uh, disulfides, but when you perm hair, some of the disulfide bonds get broken Okay, and then reformed in different shapes to give it more curl. So maybe you might have more disulfide bonds. All right, and that's the way you go from straight, straight hair, right? You're forming disulfide bonds, all right? Um, if you've already got a little bit of wave to it, you're going to be uh, breaking your disulfides and reforming them and giving it more, uh, more curl. All right, so... Properties, physical properties of thiols, sulfides, and disulfides. Let's talk about them. Let's talk about their boiling points. All right, boiling points of your sulfur analogs of these alcohols and ether, right? The thiols, the sulfides, the disulfides, they're going to be lower than those of alcohols of similar molecular weights. Why? because the oxygen is more electronegative than the sulfur, okay? None of these compounds are able to form hydrogen bonds like uh, to like molecules. No hydrogen bonds. Remember what the prerequisite for hydrogen bonding is, right? Okay, we move on, all right? That was quick trip through our sulfur compounds and we're back to our alcohols right and the preparation how do we make alcohols all right that's what we mean here preparation of alcohols well we've already learned how to make alcohols back in chapter 11 when we studied alkenes one of the reactions of alkenes was the hydration of alkenes in a hydration reaction, again, we studied them in chapter 11, so if you don't remember, go back and review. In a hydration reaction, water, the elements of water, hydrogen and hydroxyl group, are added to a double bond. So let's just take a general, the simplest alkene out there, all right, ethene, and let's... Uh, refresh our memory about this hydration. Remember, you add water and it requires an acid catalyst, right? And we said a lot of times we just put in H plus, that's it, acid, right? And the elements of water, hydrogen, is going to add to one side, one carbon, and the hydroxyl group to the other, right? And what happens? We change functional groups. We go from an alkene to an alcohol. So this hydration of an alkene is a means of preparing, synthesizing an alcohol. Okay. All right, we're going to add to that reaction here. All right. 
hydration of alkenes. So that alkene that we looked at on the previous slide was a symmetrical alkene. Right, same thing on both sides of that double bond. Not all alkenes are symmetrical. Sometimes we encounter asymmetric alkenes. What happens in the hydration of an asymmetric alkene? We're still going to get an alcohol, all right? But things are a little bit different, all right? In the preparation of alcohols from asymmetric alkenes, it's actually possible to form two different alcohols. Let's look at this. Okay, let's take an asymmetric alkene, one that does not have the same thing attached to both sides. Okay, so here would be an example of an asymmetric alkene. Okay, it's three carbons, so it's one propene would be the name, right? We can name that. Notice on this carbon here, we have two hydrogens, right? On this carbon, we have a methyl group and hydrogen. So they're not the same, not symmetric. It's asymmetric, all right? And let's point that out, okay? Let's refresh our, uh, or put in a reminder here, right? That that carbon there is bonded to two hydrogens. And this one over here is, uh, we have our carbon bonded to only one hydrogen, okay? All right, so let's uh, treat it with the appropriate reagents. Let's add water in the presence of an acid catalyst. And let's imagine what can happen here. Okay, right, we have a hydrogen. Okay, going to one side and the hydroxyl to the other. So our hydrogen could come in here and our hydroxyl here, or it could be the other way around. Our hydroxyl could come in here and our hydrogen here. Two different compounds. All right, so the last thing I said, our hydrogen could come in here and our hydroxyl here in which case we end up with the alcohol 2-propanol. Or we could flip it, right? Our hydrogen could come here. There it is, right? And our hydroxyl could be here. Here it is. In this case, what's our alcohol? It's 1-propanol. So we have the possibility of two different alcohols being formed. The question is, which one is formed? Or are both formed? Sometimes that happens. Sometimes both, but we get a majority of one. Let's see. All right, to answer our question, let's give you Markovnikov's rule. Markovnikov studied these reactions, okay? These hydrations of alkenes. And Markovnikov uh, found out that um, to predict the major product okay, in one of these hydrations of alkenes, a hydrogen is added to the double bonded carbon that originally has the most hydrogens. He found this most of the time. Okay, so that's a way to predict who uh, is going to be your major product in one of these reactions. All right, so let's come back. Let's come back to our uh, unsymmetrical, right, alkene or propene, right, um, and see if we can then predict who's going to be the major product based upon Markovnikov's rule. We're going to find the carbon that has the most hydrogens, right? A hydrogen is going to be added to the carbon that has the most. Here it is, right there. This carbon has two. This one only has one, okay? So the product that puts the hydrogen right there, 
okay, is going to be our major product. That's our 2-propanol. And the other product that puts it in the opposite place, 1-propanol, is our minor product, right? So we still get both, right? But the majority is that which puts the hydrogen on the carbon that had the most hydrogens. And the minor product is the other one. Okay. All right. So if you have a symmetrical alkene, you don't have to worry. But if you have an unsymmetrical one, you have to follow Markonikov's rule. Let's practice. Let's see how well you have internalized Markonikov's rule. Predict the two possible products. Okay, so I want you to draw both of them and indicate which is the major and minor product for the following two reactions. Okay, so we look at our starting materials and we see, oh, it's an alkene. What are we doing to it? We're adding water in the presence of hydrogen. So that kicks in. All right, and you say, aha, that is a hydration reaction, a hydration of an alkene. I'm going to get an alcohol. What happens? What are the specifics? Well, hydrogen is going to add to the carbon that already has the most hydrogens of the double bond. So we're looking at it. All right, so this one has a carbon and a carbon, not that one, right? That hydrogen is going to come in here, all right? So I'm going to draw the alcohol product that puts the hydrogen here. And where's my OH going to be? My OH is going to be here. So my hydrogen is going to go here, okay? And my OH is going to go here, all right? And you're going to draw your product. Okay, I am going to see whether I can do this. All right, now I'm not going to draw everything out. I'm just going to draw some carbons because it's so difficult to draw with this. So there's my CH3. Okay, here is my, okay, here's my hydrogen. Okay, that's already there. I'm going to put my new one on because my hydrogen of my water is going to go to the carbon that has the most already. That becomes a single bond. All right. This is my methyl group. I'm just going to put the carbon here. Okay. Just because it's so hard writing with a mouse. Again, I complain about this all the time. Um, and my OH, my alcohol, is going to come here. So this is going to be my major product. Okay. So it's asking for both the major and the minor. The minor, you're going to flip them around. Okay, I'm not going to draw the minor. I'm going to let you do that. Okay, for practice. Coming over here to this compound. All right, so remember we said this was uh, commonly done where they don't show all of the hydrogen. So you've got to go through and uh, look at this and say, okay, this is a carbon, right? And I have one, two, three right so I've got no hydrogens attached to this one and this here is a carbon and it has one two three so that means it has a hydrogen on it so you have to go through and expand things out all right when you have these um, these types of structures all right that are ultra ultra condensed okay bond line formulas as they're called all right so let's uh let's talk about where things are going to go right major product the hydrogen's going to come where i already have the most that's where my hydrogen's going to come and where's my oh going to be my oh is going to be right here okay so this is going to be the major product so we're going to draw again just the major product we're going to hope we can do it okay let's See if I can get this ring. Okay. Oh, awful. 
All right, wish we had a board here. It's so much easier. All right, so here is one. Here is my one from the water, right? From the hydration. Over on the other side, we've got our carbon, right, of our CH3 and our OH. So this is the major product. Okay, all right. And again, you can draw the minor. All right, just flip things around. Okay, so from an alkene to an alcohol, that's called a hydration reaction. We are adding the elements of water. Okay. Okay, we're back. Um, I thought we were frozen, but it turns out we're done with part one of our study of chapter 12. Uh, stay tuned for part two.